appreciate everybody out tonight and we do we will we do want to continue our study of the first epistle that the apostle john wrote and to get us to where we need to be tonight new material i'll review just for a moment what we've already studied in our study of first john thus far we've seen that uh, the apostle's aim is that we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And the reason for that is so our Christians' joy may be full, for John 1, 1 through 4. He also, or we've also studied that fellowship with the Father is contingent upon, first of all, that we walk in the light as he, Christ, is in the light, 1 John 1, 5 through 7. And in this, of course, light is defined to be the truth and darkness a lie. We are taught also that we're to confess our sins as we've studied in 1 John 1, 8 through 10. And then um, the third thing is the use of the word advocate referring to Jesus Christ's work on our half and the word propitiation. And we studied those two words um, Jesus appeased God by his sinless life being offered on Calvary's cross for our sins. He offered his body, sacrificed, and shed his blood uh, for the remission of our sins. And he is, as described in 1 John 2, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2, as the righteous. Then we notice that fellowship with the Son, who is Jesus, of course, depends upon our keeping his commandments. 1 John 2, uh, verse 3, down through the first part of verse 5. And then we are walking as he walked, the latter part of verse 5 and verse 6. Otherwise, it is not, it is not true that we abide in him, nor truly know him. So, for one to say, I know him, yet not keep his commandments, then John plainly says that the Spirit inspired him that that person is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, John, having stressed uh, the importance of keeping the commandments of Christ, goes ahead to discuss one particular commandment. And so we move from in uh, 1 John chapter 2, starting in 7, verse 7, and we'll look at that for a moment. He discusses what can be called an old yet new commandment. So first of all, let's notice the commandment itself. Looking at verse 8, and uh, I'll, of course, as I've done all through these studies of whatever book, I depend upon you to read the whole passage so we can emphasize the facts contained therein. He doesn't, John doesn't, write about something totally new to them. And that would be true of any Christians because of what it takes on the part of one to become a Christian or to be converted to Christ. But it's something they had heard, and he says, from the beginning. From the beginning of what? From the beginning of the gospel. Remember, there are no Christians where the gospel has not been preached, where people have not understood it, believed it, and obeyed it. So if the gospel doesn't get somewhere on this earth to human beings, they're not going to become Christians. But if they do hear it, since the gospel is God's power to save, then they're going to be able to be Christians if they so believe and obey it. Well, that's the way it's an old commandment, but it's a new commandment according to verse 9 because it's ever fresh. I guess we could say it's old in time, but it's new in state. Every time that a person understands the gospel, believes it, and obeys it, it's a new thing to that person. 
That person, in fact, in obeying it, has become a new creature in Christ. So it's a commandment that is ever true in Jesus. And it's always true among his true disciples. So it's both true and new, as he says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light, light is already shining. What we don't sometimes realize is that when we begin this journey in obedience to the gospel and we are converted to Christ by our belief and obedience to the same, and just read Romans 6, 3 and 4, and 16 and 17, let's see the process which begins with belief. Well, it really begins with the study of the gospel. Then out of that study, belief in Christ, and repentance is where the resolve is to die to a life of selfishness and the ways of the world. The confession of one's faith in Christ shows the courage one has to confess it before people, even if we get you in, put in jail or persecuted in some way or the other. And then to complete obedience by being baptized for the remission of sins, which, of course, is into Christ. Galatians 3.27 well, notice this, there's a state change. You come out of the ways of the world and you are now into another state. What is it? In Christ. Now this, for those who heard it, ties in somewhat with what um, J.D. had to say tonight about the church. Those who are in the church are in a different state in a different relationship with God, be living a new life. Their old sins are forgiven by God. They're now living as the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Christ being their Lord and Savior teaches them. The point I'm making is we're already drawing closer to heaven and having a different outlook on everything because we've been converted. There's far more to that word converted and most people ever realize as to how it impacts the mind of a person who's converted and the life of that person who's converted to Jesus Christ. So you've already taken the beginning step in getting to heaven. And anyone who doesn't take that step is not headed toward heaven. And we notice some time back that you can be a very moral person, but you can be wrong religiously. And that's not going to work for you. You must accept Christ on the terms of the gospel. And having done that, because all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, this is how you've come from death to life. A big change has happened, and thus conversion. So the darkness now for those who are faithful in the Lord's church is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Thus, the hope of heaven is for the new creatures in Christ, for the faithful in Christ Jesus. There grows an ever great desire to have what we have a right to expect as members of the Lord's church, faithfully serving him, and that is to be in heaven with him. So we're saved by hope, Romans chapter 8, verse 24. We can look beyond this world's veil of tears, and we can see the glory that awaits the faithful. Why? Well, we're walking in the light, as he is in the light. We're keeping the commandments of Christ. So we see further that with the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, the first coming, the word was made flesh, John 1, 14. Light has begun to penetrate the darkness. Now, I, we haven't got time to do this now, but you might want to jot some of these uh, scriptures down. We've actually already been over one of these when we were studying Isaiah in the adult class on Sunday morning. But references to this idea of light penetrating the darkness is Isaiah 9, 2. Remember, Isaiah is the great messianic prophecy, prophet. So in Isaiah 9, 2, that idea that's presented here was presented 750 years before Christ walked this earth. 
And the same idea is presented to, uh, by Matthew in his record in Matthew chapter 4, 13 through 17. And then we've already seen that in the Gospel of John in John chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, and uh, chapter 8 and verse 12 of John. So you might run those references along with what we're studying here and see that concept is well taught and in the mind of those who are faithful converts to Christ. And it's renewed as they uh, pursue the study of the Bible. So it's a command to love one another. Now, we can say that all day long, but I don't know what people think when they say we're to love one another or what they even mean sometimes they say, oh, we love one another as brethren. They have to tell me what they're talking about or show me. And so I ask the question when we're commanded to love one another, uh, how do we know this? How do we know this? Well, it's implied in verses 9 through 11, if you look at that. And it's stated clearly in 1 John uh, 3, in verse 11, and again, John does it in this letter, in chapter 4 and verse 11. So it's not left to the imagination of what he's talking about. This command was from the beginning, from the beginning of the gospel. John 13, 34 through 35. In fact, John writing there sounds just like what he says here, where he's quoting Jesus what he says here in his first epistle. Uh, it's that same idea. And in um, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 2, or rather 12, uh, and 17. So this is nothing new to the Christian and view of what a Christian or one must know to become a Christian and understand Jesus Christ and what he means by love. So what does it mean to love one another? Well, uh, I think probably several here have already done this, but it may help for us to review the different uh, Greek words for love. Uh, storge in Greek describes the love within the family, familial love. We have eros, which is carnal or sexual love, and that word standing alone does not appear anywhere in the New Testament. The uh, idea is discussed in the New Testament, but the word itself is not used in the New Testament. Phileo is a love of dear friends. Um, we've often used uh, uh, Jonathan, the son of King Saul, and David's very close, friendly association. Uh, the city of the United States and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, is meaning the city of brotherly love. So the idea of very close friends. And then agape, it's active, uh, willing of good. I would have to say here, as God in the Bible defines the good, the willing of good toward others. Now, the Greeks had no problem when they spoke of whatever they loved. Uh, to use the word. You would know immediately by the word they use what they were talking about. We don't only have in English one word, love. Though therefore, every one of these words and its various forms, when they're translating them into English, all they can do is say love. And you have to look more into the context in English. And um, then this is where it does help to have a uh, Greek lexicon or something to look up, well, what kind of love is he talking about? Just a matter of how much study you really want to know and how much you want to know about it. Now, it's agape love that he's commanding here in the text. And I've already said this, but it's the same love that Jesus was commanding, and it sounds just like John writing here in John 13, 34 through 35, which we studied earlier. It is the um, concern. Uh, it's that concern uh, to meet the needs of others, others who can't help themselves, to give them what they need uh, that's best exemplified in the life 
and in the death of Jesus Christ. And he talks about that in 1 John 3, 16 through 17. 1 John 3, 16 through 17. Therefore, we can only conclude that to love one another, that is, brethren loving one another, members of the church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, loving one another, which we're commanded to do, is to consider the needs of one another, to be mindful of who we are and uh, what our true needs are. Now, again, we might need to say there needs to be some real understanding of what a need is over and against a want or desire. And the type of needs that help one uh, spiritually uh, it may be benevolent action on our part to help someone who's a brother or sister in Christ who can't help himself. I, I might say if a brother or sister in Christ doesn't have the wherewithal that they need, then we need to be mindful as part of our faithfulness and love of that person to supply those needs. Uh, this is doing good, as the Bible defines good. And we need to be supplying it. On the other hand, brethren, because of who they are, they're converted, they're on the way to heaven. They have an obligation to let people know when they have a need and they can't supply it for themselves. Remember, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Uh, James 1, 27. Well, you know, that covers members of the church. As you therefore have opportunity to do good at all men, especially those of the household of faith. So it shows you that when love, as he commands here, of each member of the church is a part of their being faithful. In other words, a part of their walking in the light as he's in the light then they're going to be aware of the needs of their brethren. So James deals with a lot of that when he talks about it doesn't do any good to say to a person who's starving, be ye warmed and filled, except that you supply the thing so he can be warmed and filled. Uh, evidently, brethren, but James wrote to, and he was writing to brethren too, for having some problems and being mindful of the needs of their brethren. So we begin at the church, mindful of the needs of our brothers and sisters in the family of God. And we offer that. Of course, ultimately, we're mindful of their spiritual needs. And thus, that's why that we need to teach the whole counsel of God to people. And people sometimes don't want to hear what they need to hear. And we shouldn't be so surprised at that. When you raise children, many times they have to be told things they don't want to hear. And in a family situation, sometimes the children must be made to do certain things they don't want to do. And so we have an obligation, the spiritual family of God, with God as our Father and Christ, who's the head of the church, purchased it with his blood, is our elder brother and king, then we know that the church itself has been uh, guided and directed in preventive discipline as well as corrective discipline to bring people back to Christ as brothers and sisters when they sin. And if they will not repent, how the church is to deal with it. All of that pertains to needs, spiritual needs. And the church to be faithful must practice those things, as well as everything else author authorized by Christ for members of the church to do. So having identified the commandment, and uh, what commandment is being discussed, John has more to say, which we want to look at at this time. Um, he goes at this by talking about the effect of not keeping the commandment in verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Well, it's easy to do certain things 
maybe harder to do others or whatever. But some people have a terrible time when it comes to holding a grudge. And we're warned about that and told we shouldn't do it. There is a way to handle things to um, get rid of that kind of thing. We are expected that if we have ought against our brother, sister, that we're to go and settle that matter and make sure that everything is taken care of. We won't get it all that right now. Point being is this, that we don't let things um, ferment and get worse and worse. And we must be ready to forgive, even as God is ready to forgive everybody on this earth if they will but be contrite, hear, believe, and obey the truth. And so we should be. Now, that's a matter of fact. You can't forgive somebody who won't repent. God is love, and yet God won't forgive anybody that will not repent and obey his will. So we try to bring people to repentance. When you preach the gospel, you're trying to get people to keep a penitent mind by keeping a tender heart. It's easily pricked by the word of truth so that they can see their own needs and develop. So if one does not love his brother, then that one is in darkness, according to verse 9. So to claim to walk in the light as he is in the light, yet hate your brother, John plainly says, you're still in darkness. Uh, if that person has ever come out of darkness, uh, that person at this point has fallen back into darkness. He says uh, plainly here that is in darkness until now. So if a person has, has those dispositions of mind called hate, then that person remains in darkness. And despite what some may claim, they've not yet passed from darkness to light. Or as expressed later, they've not yet passed from death to life. Uh, look at First John chapter 3 and verse 14. And there John makes that very clear is the case with somebody like this. He also says in verse 11, verse 11, one doesn't know where he's going. That sort of sounds like a lot of people today. He may think he has fellowship with God. He may say he has fellowship with God. He may say all is well with he and his God and uh, all the members of the church. Uh, I'm saved from my sins. I have the hope of heaven. But John says he's really blind. He fails to recognize the absurdity of his claim to know and love God. Look at 1 John 4 and verse 20, and John says that. Now, he's blinded by the darkness that he's in, which is the hate he has for a brother. And he cannot see that he's on the road to hell. But he is. Does, well, I think it does. Uh, does this illustrate the importance of keeping the old but new commandment? Certainly it does. It's important to our study here and to where John is reached as he reasons with his recipients to consider further the effect of keeping this commandment. And that's where you come down to verse 10 and the first part of it. By keeping this commandment to love one another, one is abiding in the light. What does that mean? Well, it means that one is in full fellowship with the Father. First John 1, 7. And the first part of that verse. And that they enjoy the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. First John 1 and the latter part of verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Contingent upon what? That we walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, if you hate your brother, John says, you're still in darkness and you're not in light. So the blood can't keep on cleansing you. 
So you've got to love your brethren. There's, uh, in the latter part of verse 10, uh, there's no cause for stumbling. What keeps us from stumbling? We used to have a free moral agent. I can choose to love God and obey his will, or I can choose not to. Well, that's, of course, right. But when we choose to obey God, to obey his commandments, we're walking in the light. Well, here again, truth and right living is described as light. So abiding in the light, you can clearly see where you're walking. Think about that times when you've had to go out at night and maybe there wasn't a porch light or anything and you've got a flashlight, as we call it, and you shine it and you can see where you're going. Have you ever gone out at night and stumbled over something because you couldn't see it? Well, again, that points up why we should be continually searching the scriptures and in the light of those scriptures, searching our own hearts. Because we can blind ourselves, and we do blind ourselves when we don't have the light to walk in. But what is that light? That light is the word of God. But the word of God commands us to love our brethren. So if we don't love our brethren, as the Bible defines that love for one member of the church to another, then we're going to be in darkness and we're going to stumble and we're on the road to perdition. So fellowship with God makes it possible to know where we are going, which of course is unlike the brother who hates his brethren or a brother. That person is in darkness. Now this doesn't imply sinlessness. We've already discussed that, 1 John 1, verse 8, and verse 10. But as one walks in the light, let's just say here, walks as the word of Christ instructs us, that person is in fellowship with God, even as the apostle were in fellowship with God. And John says, I want you to have the fellowship we have with God. Thus, I'm writing this letter to you. So he knows what to do when he sins. That's an important point. He know, First of all, he recognizes sin because he knows the light of truth. And next of all, he knows what to do about it when he does sin and in what direction that he should be headed. And you see that in verse Nine of First John one. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I thought the blood of Christ continued to cleanse us, cleanse us from righteousness. Well, it does to those who walk in the light. But to walk in the light is to do God's will. Well, what is that person going to understand who walks in the light or does God's will? If you want to understand what he sins, and what does he do? He readily confesses that sin and asks God for forgiveness. He's in that constant state of awareness of the need for growth and development and the need for the cleansing blood of Christ. And thus, that person is the kind of person that will see his or her sin and will do something about it. There are plenty of people who can read the Word of God, but because of their attitude toward it, they don't have any intention of understanding really what sin is to begin with. They certainly don't understand God's perspective or view or attitude towards sin in a human's life. That's the greatest enemy we have. We worry about cancer and heart attacks and other things that some way or the other are going to kill us. And you, you can't escape that. You're going to die. That may be a blunt statement, but... Every one of us right here is true of all people unless the Lord comes back first. We're going to die. As Hebrews 9, 27 says, it's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. Well, we do what we can, but we're still going to die. Well, what then? Well, then all that matters is do we die right with God? Do we die in a righteous life? Do we die walking in the light? 
Do we die walking in the direction of heaven? Do we die trusting in the blood of Christ to keep us clean from our sins? There's where the faithful Christian has it over everybody else. There's a lot of folks who are nice people, uh, even in this wicked age. And they just don't have a need for God. They don't think about God. They don't think about death. They're in good health. They've always had plenty as far as material is concerned. Uh, they just don't think it's ever going to be any different. So they don't think about coming before God to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, and how they use this life as to whether they're going to heaven or to a devil's hell. So John wants these who've obeyed the gospel to remain faithful, and he talks about it in these terms. So as one walks in the light, one is in fellowship with God, and thus he knows what to do when he sins. Now, I don't know what to say to a person more than I've said if they know they sin and they're sitting there content to live in it. They know that they're separated from God. They know that they have committed sins that they won't quit. And they know tomorrow they're going to continue right in them. Oh, they know it's a sin. They can read God's word, but they don't change. Well, all I can say is the more that one resists the truth, knowing that they need to obey it, the harder their heart gets and the less the truth of God, the light of the gospel is going to mean to them. And they're simply making themselves harder to change. Now, this old but new commandment is so important. And if we're not keeping it, as we said, and as John writes, we are still in darkness. And if we are in darkness, we can't be walking in the light. There's no shadow you can walk in that's neither light nor darkness. You're either in the light, truth, or darkness, a lie. We're not having fellowship with God and the blood of Jesus Christ does not cleanse us from our sins. So we can't have what John says that God wants us to have, and he as an apostle of Christ wants us to have, and that's the fullness of joy. Remember, he wrote that in John 1 and verse 4. Some people have just enough knowledge of God's will to make them miserable. What do I mean by that? Well, I really have already been saying it. They know what's right. They know what they ought to do. They know the truth, but they love something else more than that. And they just won't do what's necessary in giving up something or taking something on in their life. And so uh, they're miserable uh, because they know they're at odds with God. It's only appropriate then to really, in this part of our lesson, with the admonition of John that we'll look at a little later and it's found later in the epistle, 1 John 4, 7 through 8. 1 John 4, 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You see, as we grow up in Christ, we understand God is love, and we understand through Christ that love has been manifested. And we understand as we practice the truths of the gospel in living the Christian life, we're learning about that love. We learn it's not just an emotional, sentimental, uh, syrupy thing, subjective. We learn that it's something that one can fill himself with in the sense of knowing God's commandments. Well, I think everybody ought to have good feeling and they ought to be uh, rejoicing when they know they've done what's right, as the Bible defines right. But it's not strictly the emotional part of it. It doesn't begin there. That's the result of knowing the truth of God and the demands that truth makes upon us as to how we are to think 
and to live. Now, for those who are not yet Christians, I can only uh, encourage you in a very serious manner to consider these following verses. Again, found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Again, 1 John 4, 9 through 10. Remember, I've said it already several times. It won't hurt for us to remember it. The old pagans of long ago tried to offer sacrifices to appease their false gods, their idols. But here's something new, brand new in the world they hadn't heard of, and that is the one true and living God gave his only begotten son, one of the Godhead three, who himself came to live as a man to be tempted in every point to sin like as we are, yet he didn't. And thus, God appeased God because one of the Godhead three became flesh, became a man, became a human, but never sinned and thus could go to the cross manifesting love in the ultimate to die for men who didn't even believe in. When you think of the four men of the Romans who were crucifying him, he nailed the nails in his hand and feet. He was dying for them. They didn't even know it. They were greatly concerned about dividing up what little he had. And then because he had his outer garment woven in one seam, they wouldn't tear it in four pieces, cast lots to get it. But they didn't care what they did to him. And yet he was dying for them. So that's the kind of love that we're talking about. Sacrificial love, a love that's concerned for other people not to gratify them or give them whatever they want, but to make sure you live the gospel of Christ before them and that you teach them the truth, even when they don't want to hear it. So that's the important matter when you see the idea of the propitiation for sin that Christ was on the cross. And as John says, 1 John 2, 2, he's not only the propitiation for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And thus, I would say to anybody that's not a Christian, take advantage of that because you have one life to live in this world. You show God you love him or you don't. And it's through the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16. Now, our belief and obedience are the same, that we can. And once we become Christians, that we cultivate it's love of God, the love of his will, and the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ that we might develop in the likeness of Christ. So I hope these things have helped. As we've studied this, we'll continue on next week. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer as we finish the class? Our Holy Father, we're so thankful we can review these things. And it may be new to some and may be old to others. But we all enjoy telling the old, old story. For in it we have life and have it more abundantly. We pray that thou would help us to study daily, to meditate on thy word day and night, to honestly evaluate our lives in the light of it. Help us, Father, to love one another as the Bible teaches we are to do. Help us to take the gospel to a lost and dying world, to defend the faith. Help us to realize how brief and uncertain life in the flesh is. And so live is to meet thee with joy when this life is over. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.